Well, hello. It is Tuesday, January 26th. It is 1 o'clock, and you are watching Advancement Live. I am Kim Brown. I'm here with you in Syracuse, New York. I was just telling my colleagues on the on the episode with me that I have a window that was erected in roughly 1904 and all I've heard all day is uh, wind blowing howling outside here in Syracuse so if you hear anything it's not me it's my window from 1904 Anyway, so we are talking, it's actually a, a big live streaming day for those of us who do higher education social media, our episode, and then right after this episode, a, uh, a case SMC chat all about live streaming and how do we use live video and live technology to engage our alumni, maybe parents, prospective students, any of the audiences who are interested in what's going on on our campus. and. I love it. It's so timely that we're doing this today because Periscope just announced a partnership with GoPro. Um, so if you wanted to maybe go live extreme skiing on your campus, you could broadcast that live through your Periscope account. So that is new today that that has just happened. Uh, as many of you know, Advancement Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network. It offers viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in higher education. You will get to meet three of them uh, later on in this broadcast. And our live broadcasts allow our viewers really to share knowledge and participate in discussions about what really matters to us, what are the most important issues in our industry. And today that topic again is live video for engagement. Uh, as again, you, many of you know, all episodes of Advancement Live are free. They are accessible in the video archives at highredlive.com, and they are also in podcast form on iTunes. So I think some of you were affected by those blizzards and snowstorms. You could be listening to your Advancement Live podcast as you shovel away and, and uh, get away from all the crazy weather we've been having. Today's live broadcast is made possible by iModules, and DePaul University was able to boost young alumni participation and beat expectations by 52% using some of the tools from iModules. We did just tweet a link to their case study, so you can check that out. And Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner. That is a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding and strategy and web design and a whole lot more to never before release chapters from M. Stoner's books, Social Works and Follow the Leader are now available for download as audio chapters. And we are tweeting out a link to that. You can download those chapters for free and learn more about M. Stoner's helpful resources. So I have three other faces on the call with me today, and I am really excited to introduce them to all of you. We have Jill Feldman who is a social media specialist at Princeton University. And she has actually been a writer and editor on the staff of GQ, Philadelphia and Rolling Stone magazines. And she was a producer for a news and chat show called Jane Wallace Live. She has a bachelor's degree from UPenn and a major in international <laughs> relations, minors in Spanish and French. Uh, she likes to think in 140 characters, as do we all, <laughs> when she is not doing that. Jill, what are, your, what are your things that you like to do when you're not thinking in 140 characters? Wow. Uh, well, let me think about that for a minute. I like to read. I like to cook. I like to garden. Um, and I like to read what everybody else is squeezing into 140 characters. Love it. Staying on Twitter, right? Awesome. Yeah. Well, we also have with us, we've got Matt in the middle. Matt is a vice president for advancement at Alma College, that is in Michigan. He leads a 17-member advancement staff, and they really raise resources. They increase involvement among all their constituents with what Alma College uh, priorities are. And he, it's so cool, and I can say this as someone who went to Syracuse and now works for Syracuse. Matt, you graduated from Alma College, and you just couldn't stay away, and now are back uh, working for your alma mater, right? That's right. Awesome. And then finally, we have a, uh, a, f a colleague an hour west, uh, Lori Packer, who is a web editor in university communications. She works at the University of Rochester. And she, before moving over to academia, she was the lead US editor for MSN Search. Um, that was Microsoft search engine before Bing popped onto the market. So she has a ton of experience. She has her degree from the University of Washington and also a graduate degree from Syracuse University. Proud to say that and glad to have you on our episode today, Lori. Uh, she does all of the design, the development of the university's homepage. And as you will see later on in this episode, incredible work in the live streaming realm. So. 
we will get right to it five minutes into the episode and now it's time to get down to the business that we really want to talk about today and it's not only you know the the creme de la creme tools, the livestream.coms, the ones that are really well produced and really well thought out, and that's what Lori has a lot of experience with, and I'll have her start with that, but also those new kids on the block, the Periscopes, the Meerkats, the Facebook Live, um, those new technologies that are really allowing us to bring the campus experience to broadcast that out to a broader audience. So, Lori, I uh, took a straw poll and I decided that of all of us, you have the most experience with live <laughs> streaming, uh, hands down, without a doubt. So I thought we'd start, and um, I will tweet out so folks who are following along can see. Can you talk to us about what Rochester is doing now in the world of live streaming and, and what events are really most popular for you? Sure. Um, I, I played, played a lot of games game game in my day. day. Uh, we started a live platform or our live streaming program here with Livestream.com in uh, 2010. Uh, we chose Livestream.com as the platform at that time because honestly uh, we were looking for something that we could get started with quickly and do something uh, ourselves kind of all-inclusively. So I got very excited, very enthusiastic about the idea of live event coverage after a presentation that uh, Seth O'Dell, of formerly of Higher Live, who was also at uh, Southern New Hampshire University, gave at a high web conference talking all about the possibilities of live event coverage. And that kind of made me think, you know, we're doing nothing right now. We could be doing, well, I shouldn't say we were doing, we're doing nothing. We were live streaming our commencement uh, ceremony, and that was it. And we were doing it with an in-house service that was very difficult to just kind of jump in and use. It involved a lot of production work and a lot of IT work uh, to get started. And I really thought that there was a way that we could do something ourselves uh, faster, quicker, stronger. Uh, so we started using Livestream.com, um, as I said, a few years ago. Uh, and we live stream probably about uh, two dozen events a year. Um, maybe wow. a little bit more than that, actually, now. Uh, we live stream all the uh, college music department uh, ensemble concerts. We live stream several lecture series. Uh, we live stream our big commencement ceremony, of course. Uh, we live stream lots of institutional announcements. And we just migrated just this past uh, holiday season over to the new live stream platform. For those of you who are familiar with livestream.com at all, they have a classic platform and now they have a new platform and they're very separate. Uh, so we were able to upgrade to the new platform and for the first time are working in coordination with our Eastman School of Music, which is a very oh, wow. prestigious school within that field of music uh, conservatories. And they are going to start live streaming their degree recitals. When you graduate from the Eastman School, you do a degree recital. And if you are a family member of that person at this very important moment in their life and you can't be in Rochester, New York, you can't watch that degree recital. And especially for music, this is getting to your last point, Kim, about what events are the, are, do we see the most engagement around or the most interest in? I would definitely say that our college music ensembles were the place that I started, the, play, the first events that I live streamed, because I, I kind of suspected, and I, it turned out to be true, uh, that there was an audience there that would, would crave that content. If you're yeah. a parent and you've been watching your students perform since they were six years old and suddenly you can't watch it anymore because you're in Arizona and they're in Rochester, um, that's a huge bummer. <laughs> so being able to provide that as a service to parents, I work in a central communications office. I don't work in an advancement office or a parent relations office, but as a communications uh, uh, endeavor, as a way to show how musically creative our students are, it says something about our university that we want to say. We have a strong musical bent amongst our students, even our non-majors. It's just there's a lot of musicality around the University of Rochester, and we were able to provide a service, service to an audience that really, really was craving it, that parent audience. That's kind of a long first answer, but that's kind of what we've been doing for about four or five years now here in Rochester. Uh, well, if I, I actually have a follow-up question, and if anyone who's watching has questions for <laughs> any of our guests um, throughout this episode, just tweet them using the hashtag HigherEdLive. So hashtag HigherEdLive. I'll see that. I'll be able to fire your questions away. Uh, no hard questions. That's the only thing. <laughs> uh, I'll be able to ask those of our, of our participants. But I'm wondering... Are you capturing email addresses of people who are watching? Are you getting that info, or how are you capturing your, your numbers? We don't get specific info. We don't have a landing page that asks people to sign in or have a gateway or any kind of form. It's basically just a uh, we embed our live player on a page on our new site. Anyone's free to embed it on any other page. Uh, we get traffic numbers. We get metrics from landing page and from livestream.com itself, so we can tell 
number of concurrent viewers, uh, number of minutes viewed, number of sessions, but we don't get the kind of information that I'm sure advancement professionals would want to see. Uh, we don't get specific sign-ons or uh, um, any kind of form data that we capture at the time of viewing the event. It's really just an open live platform with no uh, in personal identifying information uh, asked for. And numbers-wise, could you could you ballpark what your viewership is on, on maybe your most popular event versus a typical? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what I try to do for especially the music department ensembles, after every concert, I give them, uh, I email the conductor of the ensemble and tell them how it went. Um, we also tr we leave the chat on. Livestream player has different configurations that you can embed, and we always in include that little chat, uh, oh. which is my favorite part. It's amazing. Like I'll, I'll be live streaming a concert, and someone will say, you know, their their username will be Dad from Arizona, and they'll say, can you pan over to the flutes? My daughter oh. is the third on the left, and I'm operating the camera, so I can pan over to the third flute on the left, and Dad in Arizona loses his mind. So it's awesome. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, but I do send them numbers after each performance, and for our music department ensembles, it is typical that we will increase our live audience by about 50%. So if there's about 200 people in the room, we typically will see about 90 to 150 people watching. So online, so that's the number I like to give to the conductors because they're all about you know they're they're putting on an event. They're all about event promotion and getting butts and seats. And this is another equivalent of butts and seats. It's eyeballs on screen, but it's butts and seats. It's people that would not have been able to experience that event at all because they're not in Rochester. Um, so if you've got an audience of 300 people and there were 120 people watching online, you've increased your audience by close to 50 percent over there. Um, their in-person audience, and I don't know any event promoter that would turn their nose up or say no to having their audience increased by 50%. Um, so for the music department at concerts, that's fairly typical, that kind of 50%-ish area uh, compared to live audience. Lecture series are more challenging. We have a few, like, I have one coming up in a couple weeks that I just, I have a feeling is not going to be that great, because it's, you know, it's a Wednesday at 5 o'clock in the library Ooh. kind of thing. And it's just that really kind of just challenging time. Uh, I mean, I, I will be honest, I've live streamed events to nobody. I've live streamed events to one person. Um, but we're able to go back then and kind of, we, there are lecture series, for example, that we don't do anymore because we know that as a, as a live event, there wasn't the audience, the online audience for it. But we're able to explain why. Um, you know, we're able to explain why we don't think it's a good use of, of resources because of the, because of the numbers. Awesome. Well, thank you. That was a that was a huge first question, but I think a really helpful one for anyone who's interested in going, like I said, the real fancy um, livestream.com and having a, a nice professional camera. Then there's the other side of the coin, and Jill, I'm going to bring you in now because in, in doing research for this episode, I came across a blog post that Jill wrote, which I'll tweet momentarily. Um, it was called Lessons, Lessons Learned in the World of Utilizing Periscope. And uh, I just wondered if you could go through some of those lessons that you and the and the Princeton social team learned when you dabbled into the world of uh, of not as fancy technology as live stream, right. but trying that periscope. Right. Um, and we are still learning, but yes, you know Princeton also has a um, a more professional live stream presence. We have an office called Media Central, and most of our university events are live streamed through Media Central. By the way. The heat just came on in my office. Is that noise going to bother you? you oh, like don't hear it at all. Step so away for a moment. And I think I better turn that down. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries at all. Yeah, we actually don't hear sorry a thing. You can't hear my wind. I can't hear your heat. Oh, like no, between good. the wind and the, the higher heat. live okay. stream. Where were we? So around the edges of what our Princeton Media Central office does, we are taking our um, our social media team and our phones out to various events and um, and using Periscope to share them with our alumni, with people who perhaps have never been to Princeton's campus but are interested in just having a peek. Um, we try to go behind the scenes, we try to take people to interesting places and in the course of doing that, yes, I realized that I was learning an awful lot about Periscope. Um, so do you want me to Go through some of the sure. I would love to hear some lessons of those that lessons. I learned. Okay, I'll learn the hard way. I will say and I'm that. paying full I'm attention. Sorry. I'm just tweeting as you talk. Okay. Um, well, one of the first things that I learned is that you know, like you, I have a little bit of um, experience in television production, and I realized that the production team 
uh, on Periscope was pretty much just me. If I was if I was out there doing a Periscope broadcast, um, I, you know, I couldn't really look around for help from a producer or an engineer or anybody who could, you know, just tell me how to like work the thing and um, and give me feedback <laughs> while it was going on. So one of the first things I noticed is that um, I was also the camera person. And I sort of experimented. I tried like holding the camera really steady uh, with a tripod. And then, you know, when I was sort of looking over my own shoulder at that, um, it, it started to look a little bit dull to me. It kind of had a little bit of a, you know, a, a C span uh, oh. kind of feeling to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it it looked as though there were there wasn't enough um, attention being paid, perhaps, to the most interesting camera angles and things of that sort. So I tried to move around a little bit, which I think was possibly just sort of a, um, you know, a, like being on the board of a very rocky ship for a oh. while for our viewers. Um, so you know, so, so you sort of, sort of learn that there's somewhere in between those two experiences. There's something that our viewers might enjoy. Um, we also noticed that if you find a good place to sort of plant yourself and your phone while you're doing a Periscope broadcast, you have to be ready for a lot of people to wander through who don't know exactly what you're doing. Um, one of our first Periscope events was when we were live streaming Ed Snowden um, oh, wow. onto campus for a conversation with Bart Gelman, who is an alum and who um, is a journalist who was one of the first to um, to, un to you know help Ed Snowden tell his story. So it was a big deal. It was a big important conversation and I was sort of in the I was in the media area with a lot of other journalists who were covering it I was the only person who was trying to stream it through a phone um, so you know my my uh, camera kept getting sort of jostled at one point somebody spilled some coffee on it um, so it, you know it, it was a it was truly a live stream experience for people who are watching that um, we also sort of started thinking about timing because there's not a really good way to discern how long that broadcast is going to go before you get into it. Of course, you have no idea where the most interesting points are going to be. Um, and that's part of the fun of it, but that's really the challenge of it. In the end, I think we pretty much came to the decision that for us, for our audience, 10 to 20 minutes of Periscope was probably where we want to be. Um, anything more than that, and we saw our our hearts start to trail off. Uh -huh. um, and then, you know, finally, we also learned when we were doing our first Periscopes that once you got one phone hooked into Periscope, that phone's kind of out of commission for you. You can't really do much on it without bouncing it around and, you know, interrupting your your Periscope stream. So we realized that we really wanted, if we didn't have another person helping out on some of these uh, live streams, we at least wanted another phone so that we could sort of off to the side watch what was going on and watch what we were doing. Um, the comments were great. I think one thing that I did not include in that initial blog post about early lessons from Periscope is that um, the comments can sort of cut both ways on Periscope. Mm. We had great success initially with our Periscope um, broadcasts and commenting until we, we sort of ran into one where a, where a troll jumped on and just would not stop and would not let go and we had to disable the comments. So I think that's something else that we might think about going forward. Um, that's all we've learned so far. Awesome. <laughs> I want to say it might be Megan, could be Megan, but Maggie Faz uh, asks if you've had um, technical problems. She's not used it to broadcast, but she's watched these Periscope um, broadcasts. And I actually, I think I'm going to bring in Matt on this one because a little birdie tells me that Matt had some some technical troubles in the world of periscoping. So Matt, you want to kind of talk to us about the experiment that you tried with Alma? 
Sure, happy to. And I'll uh, I'll start by saying we probably should have read Jill's uh, blog post before we decided to dip into the world of Periscope. But here's the Alma College story. So our president, uh, Jeff Abernathy, was actually an early adopter of Periscope, and, and he introduced me to it. So it's, it's nice, I'll say, to have a president who's so tech savvy and feeds you ideas like that. But after kind of consulting with our marketing team, we decided to give Periscope a try by using it to live stream parts of our, our homecoming festivities. And our staff ran into some difficulty trying to decide, you know, which homecoming events to live stream. So we thought, well, why not try to build engagement and buy-in by actually inviting the, the viewers to decide for themselves what they'd like to see. Um, and so we invited people on social media to participate in this uh, little online survey that we uh, concocted and to kind of select the, the event that they most wanted to see. And we gave them a handful of options, but the two most popular choices were our parade and the marching band's halftime show. So we ran a, a parallel education program to teach people about what Periscope is, because it was so early on, right. and how to use it. And of course, for mobile users, we tried to get people to use the, the app, to download the app, because you need the app to be able to actually comment and to send hearts. But we also made sure to tell folks that um, they could participate on their desktops or their phones by watching Twitter for the live stream link, uh, which of course had the, you know, the obvious disadvantage of um, uh, not being able to actively participate that way. But the, this voting process that we had, it actually had really good participation, but the thing that stood out to me the most from our experience was the, the buzz. People were really enthusiastic, um, quite simply, about their college trying something new. And I think, of course, people were excited about being able to participate in the events from afar, um, but I think it was the newness and the creativity that appealed to folks the most. And I even got some calls and text messages and emails, particularly from our our younger alumni who, who just said, hey, I really appreciate that Alma College is trying something uh, new and is, uh, is being as relevant as they, as they can. So to get ready for the big day, uh, we recruited a current student to, uh, to serve as the play-by-play -play commentator. And this is very important. We conducted lots of testing uh, of our network uh, with two different service providers and actually two different phones because we knew uh, we'd be streaming from locations that were just outside of the reach of our college's Wi-Fi. And uh, unfortunately, our experience on the day of the event didn't quite go as planned. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out that we weren't able to live stream for very long at all, probably because of the large demand for 3G and 4G service that day in our small community of Alma, Michigan. Um, and exacerbating things, there were two nearby public um, institutions, big institutions, that were holding their homecomings on that same day. So the transient traffic, I think, also took up some of the 3G and 4G service. <laughs> Fortunately, our social media strategist had an emergency plan and was a quick thinker. When we lost connectivity on Periscope, she decided to convert to a campaign of uh, video clips and, and updates on Twitter and on Instagram. And that may not be as exciting as live streaming, but I think the cloud had a silver lining. So for example, we were able to tag specific student groups like fraternities and sororities in our parade videos. And then uh, those groups were really excited to be able to retweet those videos and to share them with their national chapters and their alumni bases. And I, I would say as we did this post-mortem, what we found out is that despite losing our live streaming capability, we still saw some pretty incredible increases in our engagement over and above anything we did in previous homecoming. So just to throw some numbers at you, on Twitter alone, we saw an 1,100% increase in unique engagements uh, oh. from homecoming 2014 to 2015. We saw a 450% increase in likes and a 240% increase in retweets. So although things didn't quite go as planned, uh, we certainly had te technical difficulties, um, I think we still would broadly consider our outcome to be a pretty positive one. So the moral of the story is, while you might have technical troubles, there are silver linings to the clouds of technical troubles. That's right. Awesome. Well, so do you think you'll try it again? Uh, absolutely. I think we will. Um, you know, whether we use Periscope or something different, that remains to be seen. 
But uh, we had such a great uh, experience, uh, not only from what we did, but from the build-up to what we did, um, that I think we'd be foolish not to try this again. Awesome. So the thing with, with Periscope, as I understand it, and I've tried it a couple times, and I've had the same issues um, as you had, Matt, trying to broadcast. I, I've done like when our football team runs out onto the field in the Carrier Dome, well, when everybody is using the technology in the Carrier Dome, all you see is the little circle spinning. <laughs> Too bad, so sad, not going to broadcast this right. for you. Um, but I've tried. So I just, you know, with Periscope, you're, you're kind of needing to build up an audience. It goes out via your Twitter stream. If people click on it, great. If they have the app, they can watch it within that as well. I'm excited about Facebook Live, and I know this is the newest new kid on the block in the world of um, live streaming through social media channels. Do you see, and this really could go for, for any of you, um, the benefits in maybe trying the live streaming through an established Facebook channel where we have tens if not thousands of followers or hundreds, tens of, you know what I mean, math, <laughs> not my thing, hundreds of thousands of tens of followers <laughs> who are watching, uh, who are liking our Facebook page and could watch. What do you guys think? I know that we are definitely um, going to be looking into Facebook Live. Um, it's interesting. I, you know, I haven't used it yet. I think that there are some... Um, there are some tools attached to it that are really intriguing. I think it lets you go in and edit your video um, after the live stream. I think, as you say, you can really connect with that huge Facebook audience, and we're pretty excited about it. One thing I want to mention that that, uh, that Matt spoke about that we've definitely found is a plus for us on our live streams, uh, just getting back for a second to lessons learned, is right. he talked about having a student um, ready to do sort of voiceovers and play-by-play -play, uh, on the live stream and that has been something that has been very successful for us. Our, our AVP of communications, Dan Day, has stepped in to host and narrate some of these periscopes that we've done and we've found that that's a really good way, particularly when, like, you know, like Matt's mentioned and, and you've spoken about Kim, sometimes things don't always go smoothly, sometimes things aren't always on any schedule that anybody can kind of figure out, you know, um, as it's happening, but if you've got somebody there who's kind of your your live stream anchor person um, and can provide context and keep it moving and entertaining. I think that that's really worked out well for us. It goes a long way. So yes, we will definitely be bringing that and you know every other thing we've learned onto Facebook Live at some point in the future. I think. I just uh, sorry. I just checked before the show to see if we had gotten it yet, and at our university page and on my personal account, it's not showing up. So I don't know how they're rolling it out or who's getting it at what, at what points. Um, but I think we would definitely be interested in experimenting with it. I think it, uh, because it's kind of inside the platform of Facebook instead of kind of being open and kind of on the web like a, another, like a, like a platform like livestream.com, um, I think you would want to think about, you get the benefit of, of that focus. You know you might have a good sense of who your audience is on your page and you're just reaching them uh, and you're just reaching them in the vehicle on the in the forum of Facebook and what do they want to see and do on Facebook? Um, so it definitely I, I think is is intriguing. I don't think it would replace what we do uh, in other in other uh, platforms like Livestream and Periscope. Um, but in the Facebook world, I think it's kind of cool. We did. I wanted to add uh, our Periscope experience to the, the conversation. Um, we have used Periscope to live stream the. Uh, the concerts that our student Caroloners put on inside our Carillon Tower. So we have a big library, Ross Reach Library Tower, um, with a big uh, Carillon that people actually play. And if you've never seen that instrument played, it's really interesting because it's like physically you have to bang hammers and stuff. Uh, so we've periscoped from that because it's you can't get up in there. It's this tiny little space. So it was a cool way to get inside a space that's not very accessible. Um, the video then, of course, goes away, uh, and you have to, that was one of our lessons learned with Periscope, if you want to do anything with the video after the fact, and often that's what a lot of people who want their events live streamed really want, is they want that video after the fact, maybe even more so than they want the live event coverage, so we have to kind of set that expectation. On Periscope, it's very challenging to do that, but we were able to get, I was able to get the video off the iPhone uh, before it disappeared and put it onto our Facebook page uh, when our Caroline has played uh, the Marseillaise after the Paris terrorist attacks. Uh, and that was one of our most uh, viewed and commented on and shared 
videos that we've done on Facebook. So it was a Periscope video, but uploaded to Facebook as a native Facebook video. So it was kind of an example of when you do something and capture it live, you could potentially do other things with it later on uh, if it was kind of compelling and interesting enough. It lends itself to other platforms beyond that initial live event coverage uh, goal that you set out with. Because as I understand it, in doing a little research for this episode, Meerkat <laughs> goes away immediately. Like it's just it's gone, disappears. Periscope, I think, lives for 24 hours within the app, right? And then um, Facebook Live, and that's why I'm so excited about it. I have it on my personal, but nobody really wants to see that. I don't have it on the Syracuse <laughs> University alumni one yet, so but stand, stand by for news on that one. Um, yeah, it lasts forever on the timeline, and that, what you're saying, Lori, is so true. I mean, who wants to have their uh, live their event broadcast and then have it disappear after 24 hours? If that can live on your Facebook page, and at least from the, you know, Advancement Alumni Engagement model, if they can, you know, what, a week and a half ago, we had the worst blizzard, well, not the I shouldn't say the worst blizzard ever. We had a huge storm on the first day of classes of the spring semester, if we could have walked through the quad, you know, replicating the walk that our alumni took when they were students on this campus and had that live on Facebook and then have it live, I think that's, you know, huge nostalgia. Maybe some of them don't want to remember it, but for a lot, it's like, oh, yeah, like, I lived through that. And that's where I think having um, Facebook live video live on the timeline kind of is a huge perk. Exactly, and we've actually, um, Lori, we've done the same thing. We have, you know, downloaded periscopes and put them up on Facebook. Um, as we have done very well for us there. There's a question from Joe, and Joe actually tweeted a great um, example of how David Muir. Um, he was the commencement speaker at Northeastern, and he used Periscope in his sign-off. So if you guys check out the Higher Ed Live hashtag, um, Joe tweeted that example. So thank you to Joe. Um, but Joe's wondering, for any of you who've used Periscope, how are you coordinating with your college or university's video staff, you know, the experts who can make video look nice and not have the, the shaky hand effects or whatever else? Are, are you working with your video teams? Well, we've sort of worked, we, as I was saying, you know, we've kind of worked around the edges of what our, our Media Central team has been putting up. Um, and it, it kind of, it sort of works out pretty well for us because sometimes the, the Media Central team, they have, you know, they have a lot more equipment and they have set up someplace and they have a plan for what they're going to be live streaming. For instance, um, every year in the fall, Princeton has something called opening exercises that welcomes our new students to campus and there's a lot of pomp and circumstance and everybody's in their academic robes and their residential college t-shirts and it's just a great colorful event. Um, our, you know, our professional videographers do a fantastic job of capturing that event from all of the places where they are stationed along the route but with Periscope you know we can catch those one or two points in you know in the schedule where the videographers, you know, where they, they can't be, they can't be every place at once. So, um, so working around the edges and finding things that otherwise wouldn't be on the live stream, that's worked well for us in terms of, sort of you know, coordinating and being a, truly being a team in getting out a live stream experience for our audience. Awesome. Matt, anything your team is, is talking about yet with Facebook Live? Well, um, not with Facebook Live. I mean, I think we're in this process of trying to figure out what exactly um, we're going to do in the future. There are so many different tools, and each of them have their their pros and their cons. Um, and it would, I, I think, be um, a little bit silly for us not to try and explore all of them to really get a sense of what works uh, best for our audiences. You know, some of them let you capture. Uh, email information. Um, some of them, uh, like Facebook Live, let you uh, keep the uh, the video feed. My take is that the the primary goal of live streaming, at least for us, above other goals, is to build high quality engagement with our audiences and capturing audience information and maybe some of the other benefits that we've talked about. To me, those things are important, but maybe secondary to that main objective of providing the right viewer experience and so with kind of that value in mind I think we're we're um, uh, I think finding the right tool for our audiences takes precedence over finding the right tool 
um, for uh, for our staff uh, with some of those other uh, advantages that we talked about. So it's a process, and uh, I'm I'm actually learning uh, more and more as we have this discussion. Yay! Well, that's good. And I seriously following the hashtag. Dominique um, just tweeted what they use down at Duke. Um, all love to Duke there, Dominique, from Syracuse. Uh, but you just tweeted a, a cool tool that you use to capture your Periscope videos. So please do check out this uh, the Higher Ed Live hashtag after the, the episode because there's a lot of good resources being shared on Twitter as well. Matt, I love that you said that about really focusing on what tool makes the most sense and, and leads to the biggest um, you know, engagement numbers because I think a lot of us um, watching this episode maybe feel like our higher ups are so focused on well who is watching and who specifically and capturing email addresses so do you think that the and Matt you've answered this but for Lori and for Jill do the benefits of you know trying these new technologies outweigh maybe not getting the email addresses and the specifics on who's watching well, I, us, it, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I would say for me, it, uh, um, I would say yes, but that's because I don't work in advancement, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, I wonder actually if it might be worth, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm honestly not exactly sure how to do this, but if it would be worth having a kind of an optional, do you like what you see, sign up for our mailing list kind of intake form that was very bare bones uh, and not you know, something that made you fill out an entire kind of membership into an alumni portal, for example, but just a very simple thing, um, but not make it mandatory, make it something you could skip, and maybe it would be kind of a goodwill thing that if someone liked the service and um, wanted to subscribe to something. Um, but I've, I've, honestly, I, that hasn't been where my focus has been. My focus has been more on, um, as Matt said, kind of providing that experience for, our main goal is to provide a live event experience for someone who can't be geophysically present. You know, they're not here, so they can't have the experience, but they have, they can't have the experience, but they want the connection, and this is a way to provide that connection in a live, uh, in a live way, in a real-time way, um, rather than just, you know, when we were talking about our video production team, for example, our, we have an awesome university videographer who makes beautiful videos about a lot of events and a lot of things that happen on campus, um, and those are awesome. Um, my my videos that I produce for our live stream are very C-SPAN. I we t you talked about having like a slick professional camera. I should go grab my camera and show it to you because it is like it is like the ultimate soccer dad prosumer. Oh no! Camera. And it's literally like it's a camera on a stick, and I, I have one camera angle, and I. I pan and zoom, and that's all I got. Um, so it's not uh, a hugely professional. Uh, it, it, they look great, they sound great, um, but I ain't Spielberg. Like there's not a lot of production going on. <laughs> but I make a case. I think that the the value that's being brought by the live stream service is not the production value of a beautifully produced video, which is also a wonderful thing. It's the live experience for someone who can't have it. Right. And we have enough feedback from, especially those college performances, those music performances, where you have like an entire family is sitting around, and half the family's in Indiana, and half the family's in Philadelphia, and it's they're listening to the holiday concert, and their son slash nephew is performing, and it's his senior year, and he's graduating, and it's just like it's awesome. I love. I come in at eight o'clock at night to live stream these things um, because I enjoy them, and I get. It, I think it provides that level of connection for a parent and alumni audience. I also wanted to say that our our conductors, the people the, the people who put on the events, mm -hmm. need to be uh, really, really engaged in wanting their event to be covered in this way. It's not like the, you know, the communication office can swoop in and provide this as a service, or the alumni relations office can swoop in and provide this as a service. The people that are putting on the events, the event promoters, need to be really engaged in helping promote the live stream part of the event as well. So for example, our music conductors are brilliant. They will send out, they have emails that, and I, maybe I shouldn't be saying this because I don't know, <laughs> they have their own email lists, you know, people like to contact their own people separately. Uh, so I don't know how they do it, but they'll email their uh, their interested parties, people who care about the chamber or ensemble or the, the jazz symphony, and they'll send them an email saying, we're going to live stream tomorrow's concert. The kids, will send, the one conductor will promote the event from the stage. He'll say things like, you know, most of the time conductors ask you to put your cell phones away. I want you to take your cell phones out and text your family back home and tell them that this concert's going on. Um, and we see hundreds of viewers for his concerts because he actively promotes them. Um, but he promotes them through his own personal and professional networks um, because 
that's how social works. It's people talking to each other. Well, that's uh, all of is kind of providing the, the technical service on top of it to help them be able to provide the real service that they provide, which in their case is music. And that's a great segue into one of the questions that's come in um, on Twitter, which is, and, and you've just um, touched on it, Lori, and I think Matt, you did as well in talking about the experience that Alma did, but what have you done to promote Periscopes? Because it's great to be able to go live, but then if nobody knows that you're about to go live, obviously Periscope through the app will alert folks. Um, it scares the bejesus out of me when I hear it come up on my phone because it's not a noise that I'm used to. So when someone starts to broadcast, you're like, oh, hello. Um, what is the best way to promote that you're going to be either on Facebook Live, like you said, um, using live stream on Periscope? What are some of the things that have worked for you? Any of you can take that one. Well, we, we tweet about it. Um, I, I guess we primarily work through Twitter to promote our upcoming Periscope broadcasts. Yeah, what I might add to it is that, uh, you know, we kind of look at it as uh, a, a holistic education campaign. So um, using every media uh, that you have available to tell people what you're doing, even if it's on a different medium. So even using our alumni magazine uh, to promote what we're about to do if you plan it well enough in advance. But uh, we also use Twitter as our, our primary vehicle to, to educate um, Periscope uh, uh, potential viewers. And Vanessa, hi Vanessa T. Smiles on Twitter um, raises a, a couple great points and one is that for Periscope, for Facebook Live, for these you know these new kids on the block, it's really that behind the scenes, where can a camera, a phone, a cell phone camera go that you know another camera, a more professional live stream .com type um, camera or, or production can't go? What's that behind the scenes experience that you can give to your viewers, whether that be parents or alumni or prospective students? Um, you know, we have got a hugely professor, a popular professor here on campus, Professor Copeland. So if I could sit in his class one day with my phone and he was up for it and live stream one of his lectures out on Facebook, I mean, I could see that exploding, right? Definitely. I mean, that's that's you know where Periscope works best for us. It's it's nimble. It's fast. It's sort of spontaneous. Even though we do give a lot of thought before we you know before we open it up, um, but it can go places where you know where more video equipment probably can't. And that's been really a lot of fun for us. We've periscoped a professor who juggles, um, who juggled before his class. We periscoped the Princeton University band warming up um, before, you know, before a game. So yeah, it, it's fun. It's it's fun for us. And we hope for um, our Joe weighed in with another great question. Did any of you ever design an event specifically for Periscope? Like it wasn't happening already, but you decided just to like, well, let's just do this live. Is that like you're not covering an existing event, but you're doing something that you've maybe never done before just because of Periscope. We haven't, but I think that really gets to the heart of what Periscope is all about. Um, it's this, you know, ability to capture uh, honest, organic moments, and the spontaneity and the flexibility um, of that platform are terrific. I've I've done some things. Uh, you know, on my personal account, which Kim, uh, like you, I have no one sign up to go see. <laughs> so no one wants to see a video of me throwing my dog a ball in Lake Michigan. But um, you know, we we really uh, we uh, have uh, purposes in mind where we can sort of capture the spontaneity um, of a moment. Uh, for example, we thought on um, something like Giving Tuesday, we might go into. Uh, faculty and staff offices, and uh, and thank uh, faculty and staff live uh, for their gifts, and then broadcast that to uh, folks who may be uh, uh, tuning in to what's happening on campus that day. So things like that are, are things right. that we're kind of brainstorming for the future. Aaron has a question for for all of us. Um, have any of you ever faced challenges from from the higher ups, from the management, on these tools and and how they maybe aren't inclusive enough, like? that older grads probably don't have the Periscope app or they're not on Twitter or you know our international alumni in Hong Kong they're probably sound asleep when we're live broadcasting you know a, a 
basketball pregame lineup or whatever. Any any pushback from from management on that? Well, we have, silence is golden. Good. Yeah, you know, we we haven't we haven't um, heard any comments like that. But you know, before we start using any platform, we are pretty careful about looking at who the audience is and if you know if that's a platform where our audience wants to you know wants to see more content from us. So as we add various platforms, um, Periscope, you know. The time comes and we add Facebook Live. It's because it fits into sort of you know it's one piece in the puzzle, and we know that we're reaching our various audiences, and they're they're really far flung. They're international, they're intergenerational, and we are endeavoring to you know meet every audience on the platform where it lives. So we might be covering an event and having a piece of it go out via Periscope, but we're also, if it's a big event with broad appeal, we're also making sure that there's something on Facebook and that there's something likely on our on our Sina Weibo account, um, you know, for our followers in China, um, and we're tweeting and we're putting it on Instagram and we're likely doing a Snapchat story as well. So we hope that we're, that we're reaching everybody. That way. Not look, leaving anybody you look out. Cool, you guys are on Snapchat. We haven't we haven't dipped our toe into into the world of Snapchat yet. We could do a whole other broadcast on, on Snapchat. There's some really important points uh, there, and and I would just add that you know not everything that you do um, has to be a fit for every audience. But the the broader question to me is. Is there diversity in, in, in the portfolio of things that you do and of every piece of outreach that you engage in, are you reaching uh, out to and connecting with um, the entire uh, uh, world of segments of your population? Yeah, and I think that gets back to, I mean, we still obviously produce a beautiful alumni magazine. We produce uh, photo, uh, beautiful photography and still photography. We produce long-form videos. We produce short-form videos. We're on different platforms on social. Uh, we do things on the web. We do things through email. Uh, I, I completely agree that I, I understand our challenge with Periscope is often because it's really such an in-app experience. You need that education piece like Matt was talking about to just explain how to do it and how to access it. Uh, we often get people saying, well, what's the URL? And like, well, it's not really. There kind of is a URL, but not really. And follow us on Twitter. You'll figure it out. Trust me. Um, so we have to kind of do that little piece of it. And people will either, they'll tune in for five seconds and think it's cute and hit the heart button and move on, or they'll get really into it and they'll follow us every time we pop up. Um, but I, I feel like that's perfectly fine. It's, no, it's never going to replace other ways we have of telling stories, either visually or telling stories in real time, but it's not meant to. It's, it's just another, um, as Joe was saying, just another piece of the puzzle. Dom from Duke just weighed in and said that it really hasn't been a barrier for them. Now, Dom, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you a hard time here, but he said age hasn't been an issue. We had someone from the class of '96 chime in. Now, <laughs> that's not that old, Dom. Um, so <laughs> all of us are cleaning our dentures now, as you make us feel old, uh, class of '96. But anyway, so. That is, though, a good example that it's not just your, your class of 2014, 2013 who are weighing in uh, and utilizing these tools, but also some alumni who are, um, you know, in their 40s, not that old. Anyway, uh, Aaron had a follow-up question, and then I want to make sure we have time for my rapid-fire question at the end. Um, the metrics and success factors, like what, what are some of your... Um, you know, at your respective institutions, what are they looking for with live streaming? Like, I know, um, Lori, you're reporting numbers out to your conductors, and you're kind of keeping an eye on who's watching live versus the recorded broadcast. Um, you know, what's a success in the world of live streaming? I, like I said earlier, I like to do it in terms of percentage of the in-person audience, and that's the number that I communicate back to the event promoters. Um, so I always do a quick eyeball count of the number of people in the room. If there's a lecture um, going on in the library and there's 90 people in the room and we have eight or nine viewers, we've increased their audience for their event by 10%. And is that right. okay for them? Is that a good... You look at the number nine by itself and I think that's kind of sad. But if you look at the number of people who actually attended and compare it to the online audience, 
do you as an event promoter think that's a success? And then we have that conversation back and forth about whether or not it's worth continuing to provide an online, uh, a live online event experience for. Um, so I always look at the number of viewers for the live event, uh, the amount of engagement. We, I always keep the chat window open. I love when we do lectures and people, when the event promoter engages the online audience from the stage as if they're part of the audience because they are and actually ask, you know, if there's any questions from the online audience, and then I'll raise my hand and ask the question from, you know, Joe Schmo in Minneapolis. Uh, and there's always a big kick in the room. Like, when, when that happens, the live audience gets, the, the live in person audience gets very excited. They're like, ooh, we have a question from the internet, and it gets very kind of cool. Uh, so I look at that level of engagement, but it's mostly just how, how much have you been able to increase the attendance in your event? So that's really what it is. It's online attendance. It's a different form of attendance. Awesome. Jill or Matt, anything to add on that? I was taking notes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> You're going to be the one asking or uh, asking your staff for the, the metrics. Um, awesome. So, okay, I want to end with, and I know we have a hard stop in a few minutes, so I want to make sure that we get this in because to me, this is exciting. Like, we've been trying the, the livestream.com. Obviously, you know, U of R has a well oiled machine. Princeton, you're using that as well. But this is like, you know, Periscope, maybe Meerkat, definitely Facebook Live. This is going to be new for all of us who engage, you know, whatever audience it is, whether it's alumni, parents, prospective students, whoever within our respective institutions. So I want you to press the fast forward button. It's September 2016. Um, summer's over. We've done summer vacay. We're planning ahead for the academic year. What are the three events that you will broadcast live from your campus? And Jill, you can start. Oh gosh! All right. Um, no pressure. No pressure. Well, I would say the opening exercises when our faculty is uh, when they parade in their academic robes because that's just you know it, it's really an incredible thing to see and it's something that means a lot to our alumni and also for people who aren't necessarily in the close-in Princeton University community. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a fascinating um, site and event. Um, next up, I would say the Princeton P Raid, the one and only Princeton P Raid that happens at reunions every year, which is just a thing. Um, and if you know it and love it, you will, you know, just drink in every second of that Periscope broadcast. And if not, you'll just sort of be amazed by what the P Raid is. Um, and finally, if um, if Princeton beats Harvard and Yale in <laughs> football, we have a Bonfire. Oh, wow. so I am definitely planning to um, to periscope from our bonfire next year. So you are definitely that's, that's planning to be at Harvard and Yale that's next year, is what you're saying. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Now, what are you thinking for next year? Fast forwarding to September 2016, what are you guys going to try? Well, I think it's pretty clear that there's an appetite for us to live stream parts of Homecoming again. But since I talk so much about Homecoming, I'll, I'll try to think of three others that, uh, that that we've been discussing, three other ideas. We're tinkering with um, with the idea of possibly doing reunions. Uh, so live streaming parts of our reunion, we do um, not a ceremony, but a program, especially for our 25th and our 50th class years. And I think that um, folks from those groups might enjoy participating from afar. Um, had an idea for possibly uh, doing our alumni and community awards ceremony um, so that we can uh, take an opportunity to, to really promote the, the accomplishments uh, of our really successful alumni even more than we already do. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, maybe even uh, including um, sort of those um, uh, honest, sort of sporadic, uh, spur of the moment uh, occasions on Giving Tuesday. Uh, where someone is expressing heartfelt uh, gratitude for generosity. Awesome. All right, Lori, last but not least, what are you thinking for, for the year ahead? Uh, the holiday concert for our jazz ensemble and wind symphony, because we will always live stream that, because it's amazing and awesome. Um, so that's not new, but I would be criminal to not live stream that in 2016. Um, a class, with, and I think this is, you, you already mentioned this, Kim, but I would love to do more kind of classroom academic stuff for both prospective student audience and an alumni audience, which we've never done. So we have a very similar kind of wonderful professor who everyone fondly remembers him, and his classes are always oversubscribed, and 
He teaches a class in the history of jazz music um, that is like an event to be at. So just live streaming his one o'clock lecture on Wednesday from Facebook video would be kind of amazing. Um, and then I think on, a, uh, on the Periscope front, I haven't done anything with Periscope beyond the Carillon concerts that I described earlier. I think it'd be fun, as Matt said, to do something with Periscope at one of our reunions. We do a 50, uh, we do a medal ceremony for our 50th. So when our 50th reunion class comes in, they get a little gold medal. Um, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of the people in that class are sort of you know they're married to each other and they're friends with each other. So there's a lot of great family stories that come out of that reunion, and we do a great job of that in our alumni magazine. But we've never done any live event coverage of it outside of still photography in the magazine. So that would be kind of fun to kind of pass an iPhone around the people at that event and have them say hello to people on Periscope. Awesome. Love it. Well, look at that. It is 155. What that I that was like the fastest 55 minutes ever <laughs> for me as I uh, really learned a lot from all of you and what your experiences have been. Um, learned a ton from everyone who was tweeting on the Higher Ed Live hashtag. There's another one just coming in, so let's make sure. Oh, okay, yep, that was just uh, Vanessa giving a nice shout out, um, setting the goal of percentage of total attendees, like how that's um, been increased through the live streaming efforts. So yes, another thing that I think all of us took away from from this episode today. So a huge thank you to to Jill at Princeton, go Princeton, beat Harvard and Yale, um, to Matt at Alma College in Michigan, and to my friend down the throughway in Rochester, uh, to Lori at the U of R, all of you doing some really neat things in this in this world of live streaming. And I really appreciate you spending the hour with me to share some of what you have learned, lessons, and, and future ideas. And we'll all be keeping an eye on each other now moving forward to see what we all do in this, this new world. Thank you, Kim. Great. Thanks, well, thanks to all of you, and thanks to iModules and to M. Stoner for making this episode of Advancement Live possible. And make sure to check out the rebroadcast. If you missed anything today, check out the Twitter uh, hashtag HigherEdLive. And we'll see you all in a future episode. Thanks so much for watching.